So uh, just briefly, I was going to introduce you to um, the workshop and a recap of the objectives, and then I will call upon Albie to do a brief opening prayer. So thanks, Maru. So this is the Regional Strategic Planning Workshop for uh, the Pacific Island Countries and Territories Disease Control Program staff to review, develop, strengthen, adapt their national vector surveillance and control plans. And we provided to you um, when you signed up to come to this workshop, some of the materials that will help you review your plan or start your plan, adapt your plan, according to the new framework for national surveillance and control plans for Aedes vectors in the Pacific. We do know that three of the countries in our region also have malaria, but that they also have some malaria plans. And when we do the one-on-one -on -one support, if that's what you want, we'll work with you to see how the two uh, can work together. But we'll come to that at the end of the workshop about what the next steps are. Thanks, the next slide, thanks. So the objectives today are actually to go through and review the principles and components of the framework and the manual to guide Pacific Island countries and territories vector control planning and elimination and implementation, to explore in more depth some key components of the framework from a planning perspective, to share experiences and lessons learnt with each other around the implementation of various aspects of the framework, and then for each country to identify the next steps in what they want uh, to finalise or strengthen their control plans and the role we can play to help you in that. So on the next slide, uh, this is just very briefly, we've got three days, two hours a day, always starting at this time. Today is very much around the overview of the framework and manual and we'll have group work, every day we'll have group work. Tomorrow we'll get into some key components, insecticide resistance management, human resources and training, community engagement and risk communication. And day three, we'll get into operations research, inclusiveness, monitoring and evaluation, and a range of other issues plus next steps. So just briefly, and Tanya said that a bit earlier, what is PAC Mozzie? So very briefly, uh, next slide. It's a project to enable more effective vector-borne disease control in the Pacific Island countries through sustainable best practice vector surveillance and control programs, a primary focus on Aedes and a secondary focus on Anopheles vectors. The project's designed to have a broad regional level impact to improve health security. The, that includes these essential components to support vector control, vector surveillance, implementing best practice, improved data management, communication and community engagement. And a major outcome, which is what this workshop launches today, will be practical and actionable country-specific strategic plans to enable sustainable control, containment and outbreak responses. On this next slide, this is just briefly the philosophy and strategies of Pat Mozzi. I won't read them out per se, but it's very focused on capacity building, and targeting needs that you all identify yourselves for your country. We'll look at if the, the program constraints, so be very realistic about the existing human resources, infrastructure and constraints that you may have, and see how can we use those resources better to encourage the use of uh, you know, vector control, the resources you have and the data for decision making. All of this focuses on evidence-based WHO strategies and techniques. And again, it's very much around capacity building and we'll use existing networks and software. There's no creating of new systems through the pac -Mosi. On the next slide, it links very closely to the global and the regional vector control strategies. You'll see the four objectives of pac -Mosi here vector surveillance needs, vector surveillance capacity, vector data management, and today's one, number four, evidence-based vector control plans. But underneath all of that is capacity building and community engagement as strong foundations. Already two surveys were done under objective one, and we've used the results of those surveys to help inform 
the deep dive that we'll take on some aspects of vector control strategic plans today. On the next slide, these are some of the outcomes. I'll just let you read those briefly. In green, I've shown what this workshop helps attain today. And uh, Tanya will put some details in the chat around how to access the training, but there's a large capacity building component. And these are all of the modules. And we've drawn upon those if you want some more detail around some of the details we talk about today. You could also access those training modules, which will help step you through all of that detail that you see up there today. Thanks. And the last slide is just all of the partners that PACMOSI has. It's funded by the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security, but also we now have funding from uh, support from SPC and also from the French Development Agency to help some other aspects. So it's a very large group of people who are working with us. So thank you very much for your attention. So now I'll just ask Albi, would you like to give us an opening prayer? Thanks, Albi. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Maxim. Um, <clears throat> let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning from across the Pacific to review our vector control strategies. We ask that you continue to guide and bless us during this three, three days workshop and and uh, we, so that we can achieve uh, the outcome that we want <clears throat> for under, under Park Mossi. So thank you again. And we look forward to your blessings during these three days. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Albi. So it's, it's a great pleasure now to hand over to Amanda Murphy. I know many of you know Amanda, uh, and many have been old friends with her for a long time. And Amanda is going to give us an overview of this framework and guiding principles and components. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Maxine. I'll just share my screen and just let me know if you can see the proper view. Yeah. Does that look okay? Yes? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I've been away on leave recently and uh, I've missed you all. So I'm excited to be back and getting into some meaningful work with strategic planning. Uh, most of you know me, I think, as a WHO uh, Vector Surveillance Officer based in Suva, Fiji. And so today I'm going to talk a bit about giving you an overview of the strategic strategic planning process and also focusing on um, outlining some of the key points of the new um, WHO guidance document, which uh, you should have seen a draft version of at least, um, the framework um, for developing surveillance and control plans for 80s vectors. So, um, oh, how do I change? Okay, here we go. Okay, so an overview of why we're here, why we're doing strategic planning. Strategic planning is essentially a tool to help guide staff um, on what to do and when to do it when you have an outbreak of mosquito-borne disease. Um, it, it gives us a roadmap uh, of, of, um, of the goals and day-to-day -day activities uh, that we're doing to prevent and respond to mosquito-borne diseases and to minimize their um, impact when they do happen. So essentially it's about being ready to act when and where you need to. And of course, within the, the resources that you have available. Um, so I've just put some examples up of some national plans around the Pacific. Uh, and this is to illustrate that, you know, each country has a different approach to planning. And some countries have a plan that covers all vector-borne diseases, while others, um, you know, 80s-borne disease might fit into neglected tropical diseases, and others might have disease-specific plans for malaria or dengue and other things like that. And all of these are totally fine, 
what we want to emphasize through this process is that we'd like to work within the departmental structures and planning processes that that are already in place across the countries um, there's no need to reinvent a totally new plan in a in a totally new way if if that doesn't fit within um, what you need um, so it's about working within what you already have and and there's lot many many options possible possible there so um, the support available for any planning process um, you know WHO plays a strong role in that and, and puts out a lot of guidelines around that obviously and many of you have WHO offices in country that you can where you can access technical support and advice if you need it um, there's obviously the regional office in Fiji now, which now has a vector control person. <laughs> so please, um, I'm here if you want to reach out for any questions at all. And we're, we're very lucky at the moment to have the PAC Mozzie program, where we have WHO, James Cook University, the Pacific Community, and many other partners all working together to support um, improved planning and capacity building for aedes born diseases and vector control in the Pacific. Um, and so please take advantage of this process. It's great to see so many of you here today um, to start thinking about how we can do better planning and, and better response at the end of the day for aedes born diseases. And I've put the pictures of the, the two new guidance documents that are most useful that we've, re we've recently been working on. Many partners have worked across these documents um, to try and provide the latest guidance and best practices for 80s vector control and, and tailoring that to the Pacific region. So I'm sure all of you have a copy of the, the manual for surveillance and control of 80s vectors, which SPC released last year. And I believe they've been busily sending copies to everybody. Um, there's also, it's also online. If, if some of you for some reason haven't seen it, we can post a link um, or I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's been shared in the documentation before this workshop. Um, but today I'm going to focus on the document on the left, the framework for national surveillance and control plans for Aedes vectors in the Pacific. And this document is, uh, it hasn't officially been released yet, but it's just waiting for the final approvals to publish. But um, hopefully you've all received a copy of the, the latest draft. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that, you know, it is still a draft. And if there's anything in there that you're reading through and you think doesn't make sense for the Pacific, please feel free to let me know. Um, there's already been a couple of small errors pointed out to me. So um, don't be shy. If I, I am going to be making a few final tweaks and I'd love to have your feedback if there's any anything you notice. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to spend the rest of this, my talk this morning guiding you through some of the key components of of what's in this document um, that might guide our, our workshop and our planning process to follow. And I guess the first principle, as I sort of mentioned earlier, is to tailor the process to each country and the plans you already have, the resources you have, and also the d disease situation you have for Aedes born diseases. It, we know that there's a lot of variation across all the Pacific Island countries. And we really like to work with you um, to apply all the guidelines and best practices that are recommended to your situation in the most rational way. Um, it's also important to remember that these plans are not static documents. Um, they're, they're something that is always being reviewed. You know, we recommend that you review your, any of your um, strategic plans every three to five years. And so it's useful to remember that if you create a new plan now or for 80s born diseases or 80s vectors, um, you know, that can be adapted later as you learn, as you learn more or if your situation changes in, in terms of the types of disease risks um, faced in your country. Um, the final point is that the, the most, really most effective way to approach aedes born diseases is to be quite proactive about our vector control activities and, and vector surveillance being key in that rather than, than reactive when outbreaks happen. Of course, we need to know what to do when they happen as well, but um, just emphasizing the importance of prevention being better than cure in most cases. So uh, this page is taken from the framework and it's sort of the overview of all the steps in the strategic planning process, so the seven steps. And I just want to highlight that these four sort of in the middle are really the core components that form your 80s born disease control plan. 
So it's a, a situation analysis, a strategic plan, an implementation plan, um, and an annual work plan. They're basically the four things that we recommend that you include in, in, in any plan. Um, and the other steps are around planning and finalizing um, the process. And so I will touch upon each of them, but I'll try to focus more on those four key components. So firstly, just organizing the process. It's important to note this because it is important that, uh, you know, good coordination and good preparation make all the difference. And really, this step is really just about um, thinking about who you want to be involved in this process. Um, obviously, you might want to start by talking with senior management if necessary, if you, you need to seek your relevant approvals to even develop a new plan and make sure that they're on board from the start of the process. You might want to establish a, either a steering committee or a working group of some sort of, of the right people. They might be from different departments or even different sectors that might work together on such a plan and then just organize the, the general steps that you expect to be taken in terms of meeting with the, these stakeholders, discussing and, and laying out these different components um, and finalizing and getting the, the final approvals and whatnot. So step one, plan. Step two, uh, the situation analysis. Uh, so yeah, people might call this different names and different plans. Um, and some people might put this under sort of a, a broad sort of country profile or disease profile. You know, a lot of people, they might be called under different names, but essentially the situation analysis is a review of the local um, disease situation and risks in your country. And for the purposes of vector-borne diseases, also the entomology data that you have available. Uh, you might um, look at a historic perspective and a current perspective of, of what's happened and what the risks are in your country, cu current and future. And also take into account um, any reviews or new recommendations that you'd like to integrate. And it's really just building a picture of, of what is needed in, in this area at this time. Uh, you might also take the opportunity to look at current strengths and challenges of your your health program or your vector-borne disease program and, and look at what the challenges are, just documenting and noting those for the record and to inform, this really informs the next steps, which is the strategic and implementation planning. Setting the scene. Um, as an example of uh, summarising your current vector control situation, you might just like to include a table such as this, which I've taken out of the framework document, uh, to just document the vectors that you know you have and what you know about them in terms of the disease risk, this ge geographic distribution and their um, feeding and resting behaviours that might be of relevance. Uh, it might be interesting too to go through this process and note where any gaps are, where you might need to perhaps um, do some operational research to, to, to learn more about key vectors um, in, in like certain locations. Uh, so it's just an example of, of something you might include in the situation analysis. And moving on now to the strategic plan element um, of your Aedes born disease plan. And this is really where you lay out the, the goals and objectives for what your Aedes born disease control program is aiming to achieve. Uh, and you know, these can be very varied depending again on the, the situation and current risks and needs in the country, which you'll identify through the situation analysis. And you'll lay out a few strategies and uh, to achieve the objectives that you've decided are appropriate for, for your situation and countries. Um, and also having a think about how, how will you know when you've achieved these objectives? What, what monitoring and evaluation can you put in place to decide that you have achieved the objectives laid out here. And to help you start thinking about what kind of strategies and objectives you might have in mind, there's a nice table here from the framework, uh, which just summarizes all kinds of the key elements that you might wanna consider when you're, when you're going through the planning process for 80s born disease control. You know, starting with the level of risk of 80s born disease in your country, um, which you see along the top um, and going down through all the types of key activities you might conduct depending on that risk 
Um, and so you might have, depending on your situation, strategies around um, increasing vector surveillance um, in certain locations. Uh, you might also have strategies and goals around ensuring multi-sectoral collaboration, for example, um, or increasing operational research to answer some, to fill some knowledge gaps. Um, so this is uh, in the document to help you start of start thinking through that um, strategic process. So after you've got your strategies down and you've got your goals and this is what we want to do, then we, this is really the nitty gritty part where we think, how are we going to actually achieve the goals that we've just set? Um, so we have to define activities under each um, strategic objective that we've set. And you know, this is the more operational part of the plan. Uh, the who, what, why, when, and how of, of what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, who is going to do it. And this element is usually one of the more detailed parts of the plan. This really forms a big chunk of your 80s born disease plan. Um, and the, the 80s manual that I mentioned earlier is, is a really useful document to look at here for, for getting some guidance on what are the, the best practice and the options for you. And I know my colleague Tanya from JCU is going to talk through that in a little bit more detail after me. Um, and so finally, just to say that there'll also be a significant section in, in this part of the plan, which will talk about coordination, um, program management, um, monitoring and evaluation, you know, vector control resources um, that you have and, and that you don't have and how you're going to deal with that. So it's quite a significant um, section of the plan. Um, a couple of examples, because it is such an important and large part of the plan. So for example, um, under you might have a, an 80s surveillance element in the implementation plan, and you might think about some of the monitoring, some of the 80s indicators shown on the screen here down the left. Um, so the adult doing some adult trapping to look at um, the occurrence of particular species in particular locations, um, down to defining what your larval habitats are in different areas and you might decide to do these um, very regularly or, or less regularly again depending on the level of risk um, in different areas of, of 80s born diseases and also of course the resources you, you have available and the manpower to actually do this kind of surveillance so uh, again an example here of just some things you might consider and for vector control as well um, another table from the framework shown here um, which just summarizes the types of interventions that you might consider. Um, thinking about specifically, you know, which areas that you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, before outbreaks, during outbreaks, um, what the target vectors are, what, what pesticides or tools are you going to use. You can really get into a lot of detail in this implementation section of the plan about, as I said, what you're going to do and where you're going to do it and how you're going to do it. Um, so, Moving on now to the final component of, of your 80s control plan after you've done, you've got your strategies and objectives, um, you've got your very detailed implementation plan, and now it's time to translate those activities into an annual program of work, um, what you'll do year by year. And this, this part of the, of the control plan um, is essentially sort of uh, it can often just be an Excel spreadsheet mapping out um, activities and, and who will do them in a time frame. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, and importantly, outlining the annual budget to support these activities. And that's where throughout the planning process here, you want to match that to your annual budget cycles as well. Um, so getting really down to... Um, what will be done each year. And that might look something like this. Um, again, you can find this example in the framework document, but looking at um, you know, under each particular component of your program, what specific activities need to be done, who's going to do them, and in what time of year do we expect that to happen? Uh, and this would be matched obviously to, the, to a budget, which would cost each of these things. Um, this would also include things like staff training, for example, um, that might happen throughout the year. And even things like reviewing the plans, you could put, you know, annual reviews in here as an activity. 
um, you know, that's really up to you and, and what you decide. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of what you're going to end up with um, when you've mapped everything out. So finally, um, we've now gone through, you know, um, these key steps. And the, the last part of the process is really just to collate those and finalise those um, into its final, into the final version. And so to briefly go through the final steps, um, finalising and adapting the plan. Uh, essentially, that means producing a document or, or documents, depending on what obviously suits your country and your needs. It doesn't have to look like this, but just to give you an idea of sort of what the end product could look like, it might be, you know, it might be called an 80s born disease plan or it could be called something else. It might have a few different sections in it, um, but you can see the four sections in red there that are, um, you know, the core elements that I that are mentioned in the framework. Mm -hmm. And so they're the four that we, we, we would want to see in there somewhere and, and what you put before and after would be up to you or whether you choose to integrate this, you know, with a broader plan. Uh, so that's the, the finalising process. Um, and then you're nearly at the end. Uh, once you get there and you've collated all of that hard work, you, you then want to share and review you know, a, a final draft version with senior management and any other relevant stakeholders or partners that have been included in the in the process. Um, make sure that you get any feedback uh, and update as necessary and that, you know, the stakeholders are happy and they're agreeable to what's in the plan. And, and that's particularly important with respect to um, resource availability, particularly if different yeah. stakeholders are providing yeah. different resources. Um, I know there are some countries where uh, case management management is in one department and those resources are there and community engagement is in another and vector control is in another and they all need to, to work together. So it's important to have good coordination and agreement amongst them. You might even consider having a, a stakeholder meeting um, to bring them all together once the process is finalised and, and, and agree um, on what has been um, generated and and finally, of course, once you've done all of that, um, hopefully you're ready to put the plan into action, actually um, benefit from all of that hard work by, by using um, it as a, as a useful guideline for, to guide your day-to-day -day program and to achieving um, those goals that you've set out to achieve. And so with that, I will I'll finish there. Uh, and just say I'm excited to, to move forward through the next process to guide you through these steps in more detail and I'm happy to work you know, with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about how we can adapt these steps to your specific situation. I think I, um, if there's time, I can answer a few initial questions now. I'm otherwise happy to work with, talk with you and work with you more throughout the workshop and afterwards. Thank you. So we thanks Amanda, thanks very much. And um, you have got we've got about four minutes um, that we could take any key questions on on this at all. So if people just pop their hand up, uh, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, an icon that says um, I'm not looking at one at the moment reactions. So you can raise your hand up on that. Are there any questions or pop anything in the chat? Maru is looking at chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see we've still got colleagues. Welcome everybody who's joined us as we've been presenting. Nice to have you on board. No, it seems at the moment we've just put in case anybody um, hasn't received or is not sure where their copy of the framework is. Maru's just popped some details in the chat for you to also look at. No, I think, Tanya, anything more you just wanted to add to that? Otherwise, we'll move on so we can get back on time. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Amanda. And my um, presentation will follow on from Amanda's with more detail. But um, Fata Pala from Samoa, do you have a question? Um, 
Thanks, uh, Dr. Amanda, for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, it seems like that uh, we are missed out from the first uh, uh, meeting that was proposed in the last uh, four weeks. But uh, your presentation provides a, a very good uh, feedback of uh, a previous uh, meetings that we have been done in the Pacific Islands. I just want to acknowledge the uh, WHO and also the SBC for this manual that will already been done as part of the Global Vector Control Program in the Asia Pacific. Um, but with your presentation that uh, there, are, there are a lot of areas that we need to um, keep on discussing as a way forward for, uh, for some areas, especially from us in Samoa, it's, it's a lot of other issues that needs to uh, need support from not only the WHO and the SPC, and also uh, our colleagues from Fiji and also from other parts of the Pacific, like in Tahiti and uh, Nicodonia. Uh, I think specific areas that we need more uh, assistance is more on developing our our national program. A review uh, so that we can adapt that uh, specific manual aids to to the conscious of Samoa uh, in terms of reviewing programs. Um, we have done a lot of programs at the primordial level, uh, but we we are more than happy to uh, uh, introduce a lot of tools and equipments so we can strengthen the the importance of this monitoring and developing. Uh, identifications and more mosquito traps so we can have a, a very good uh, data in terms of uh, of monitoring and how this how this uh, reporting using the GPS will uh, provide on the table for decision making of our leaders so um, that's why we need to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Amanda for a very good presentation and we look forward that we can work hand in hand, networking, uh, so that we can uh, uh, work together with uh, the JCU, especially Tanya Russell and other colleagues from, from JCU, and also from our main office in Fiji. Um, so uh, just a few comments from us, but uh, we look forward that we continue on this kind of uh, networking and discussions for the Pacific, uh, Fiji, Tonga, Manawatu, and other colleagues from the small islands, so we can develop the importance of uh, of this uh, mosquito program and how other interventions like the Bupakia uh, in Fiji, Solomon, and Manawatu will help out in, in Samoa in terms of more intervention for 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 small islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. I don't see any other hands up at the moment. So, uh, but you can always use the chat. So keep looking at that chat function. We're monitoring that all the time and we'll answer it in the chat. Or if it's something we think others also might want to hear about, we'll find a time in the program to, to put that to everybody's attention. So thank you for your comments. I'll now just hand over briefly to... Attention, attention, testing of a fire alarm system will now commence. Please do <laughs> fire alarm as this is only a test. So just excuse us for a moment, it'll be a loud noise in one minute. <laughs> Always happens. Always. Come on. Um, I'll just jump in there just to say um, I am going to be here for the length of the workshop. If any questions come up, I'm around and I'll be joining the group work as well. Um, and obviously oh, around afterwards yeah. as well. So if you can't, don't have a particular question right now, uh, feel free to ask in the next few days or reach out to me in chat or send me an email or anything. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Thank you.
I think the fire alarm is going off now. They've, they've yeah. muted their <laughs> microphone. <laughs> I think so too. Um, and I was just looking at the agenda. I think um, the ne next is Maru to give a bit of an overview of the results of the needs assessment survey. So we might just wait for her. Yeah, that uh, was. Wait, somebody, else, somebody, else yeah. Muted, somebody muted us. We didn't mute ourselves. But anyway, the fire alarm's finished and Maru is going <laughs> to present um, the needs assessment, which was part of objective one and has helped us inform about what we're going to do in this workshop. Thanks, Maru. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hola, everybody. I am Maru Castellanos. I am very excited to be working along with all of you. And I am a lecturer at JCU and also part of the FACMOSI teams uh, um, working in the strategic plans. So as um, Amanda Maxine was saying, I, I will just highlight a few of the most important components that we saw in the in this needs assessment that, that, that was done by several of you. So thank you so much. Uh, so as you remember, the FACMOSI group sent this needs assessment survey, and it was designed to really understand better the needs and the areas in which we can work together to support uh, the national vector control programs uh, to improve vector surveillance and vector control. And there were several components, but we will just focus on the component related to the strategic plan. So one of the questions was like of, of the countries that answered that by the way were 17, so that was a very good number. Uh, if the strategic response, if there is a strategic response plan that incorporates uh, this control of the 17 countries, six, they do have a plan, three have a draft, and eight do not have a plan. And then there was a question about if you consider this a priority, the formulation or revision. And as you can see, most of the countries recognize this as a high priority uh, uh, component that we have to work. So that's the reason that we are so happy that several of you are here. Also, I just want to point out that of, of these plans, of the nine plans that have, have been already, there is a plan either drive, draft or finalized. Uh, five of them, they have this IDES control is part of a, of a big vector control plan, but four countries have that as a separate component. And this is just so important because when we are thinking about updating or revising these documents, we don't have to start from scratch. If there is already a vector control plan, then that can be incorporated there. Then also, uh, uh, we wanted to know if in the country there was have, have guidance for either vector surveillance and control. So in the left uh, figure, we can see that regarding either vector surveillance, most countries do not have a guideline for that. Uh, just 18% of the countries have uh, some type of guidelines. And in terms of vector uh, control uh, of AEDES, we have that 40% of countries uh, do have a plan and 20% is under development. So we can see here areas in which we can work to, to start having all the countries have this type of guidelines. And finally, because this really informed uh, to us, which is the areas we have, we have to focus uh, in, in these three days workshop, we ask the countries uh, the presence of key components of the strategic plan. As you heard in Amanda's talk, there are several areas in which we want now that the strategic plan have that component. And most countries have incorporated either vector control, management of mosquito control equipment and insecticides, either vector surveillance, uh, but the areas in which we, we will work more in depth during this workshop are the ones that we are we can see that we need uh, to start thinking about it in the strategic plans like communicate, community engagement and risk communication, human resources and training, uh, data information systems, and uh, operational research. And as you can see, inclusiveness, gender and disability equality is an area that is important that are, is now part of the strategic plans, and we will be discussing that in day three of the workshop. So I know that this was super quick, but just to give you an overall idea of, of how this helped us to uh, design uh, our workshop, and hopefully we can work together in this series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maru. So it's really just to give you an idea, we're not going in the next three days through every component of the strategic plan, but have identified the ones that seem to need a little bit more support or explanation. 
So well, it's now our, um, our pleasure to invite Tanya to talk about vector surveillance and control. And uh, over to you, Tanya, looking forward to this. Oh, hi, hi, everybody. Um, so as you all know, my name is uh, Tanya Russell from James Cook University. So, um, okay, so today I'm going to give a presentation covering two topics, being really focusing on the current best practice for vector surveillance and um, vector control. So uh, as we just saw in the overview of the um, needs assessments that these were, uh, these are obviously the main areas that are covered in um, the existing strategic plans. And what I just wanted to do was go through the best practice um, to, to help people to start thinking about um, if and how these components of the strategic plans need to be updated. Um, so first I'm going to talk about vector surveillance. Uh, so what is vector surveillance? It is the collection, analysis, and interpretation of entomological data. And the purpose of vector surveillance is to provide data that informs managers of the best control strategies to use. And this information is based on the mosquitoes that are present and also identifying locations that are high risk for a mosquito-borne disease. So the WHO now considers surveillance including vector surveillance, so vector surveillance and um, case surveillance as core interventions. And vector surveillance in particular um, helps to ensure programs remain effective and responsive to mosquito-borne disease threats. Um, it guides uh, programs to be effective and to adapt to local conditions and importantly, uh, provides vector data that helps us to understand the environment, the receptivity of the environment to transmit diseases. And what is important to note is that vector surveillance data is not generally useful for predicting the occurrence of an outbreak. Um, that, that's because mosquitoes are just one component of why an outbreak occurs. Um, Nonetheless, vector surveillance data is important and it's part of our preparedness and response. So vector surveillance data needs to be standardized, of high quality and used for decision making. Uh, so the WHO has identified five main objectives of vector surveillance. And the first objective is to define receptivity, which is the potential of the environment to transmit mosquito-borne diseases. Hi. The second objective is to monitor uh, vector-borne vector densities being the abundance of each species in the environment. The third objective is to monitor insecticide resistance, uh, which is the ability of the mosquitoes to survive after being exposed to insecticides. And uh, just a couple of points, this um, fourth objective um, term threats really um, refers to changes in the composition of the behaviors or um, of the mosquito population. So this might be changes such as a change in the density over time, um, a change in um, the behaviors of the mosquitoes that make them less likely to be responsible um, respond to mosquito-borne, um, to vector control. And the final objective is to understand gaps, gaps in our coverage, access and use and quality of vector control tools. So designing a strong vector surveillance program requires an understanding of the risk of arbovirus outbreaks. So this is, is, is forms the base of, of where we start. And this is part um, of the scoping um, project. So we need information on the, the understanding the risk of arbovirus outbreaks, the transmission scenarios, and also the vector control activities that are in place. Um, so um, Amanda uh, mentioned this, and I just wanted to provide a little bit more detail about 
understanding the risk of arbovirus transmission um, and how this could be these this could be slightly defined differently in different countries. I know Guam and um, a lot of the American USAIPs have tiers in place already, and those tiers actually do align quite closely with these um, definitions of high, moderate, and low um, risk of an outbreak that have been used in the, doc, um, the 80s manual and also the framework. So, and, and these basis can be used to stratify your vector surveillance and control activities with really focus on those high risk areas where ADs vectors are present, arboviruses are circulating or sporadic, and there's a regular income, um, regular influx of travelers. Um, yeah, so Amanda showed some of this already, and I'm going to go through a lot of these tables and flow charts um, and provide some detail. But I will say up front that we don't need to memorize all of this. Um, it is in the 80s manual and the framework, all of this information. But just really to start introducing um, a lot of the terms that are used, which is really important as well, and to think about um, how risk stratification can be used to provide the basis for designing your vector surveillance and control programs. And um, so we can have these low, medium and high risk areas. And then um, in terms of vector surveillance, the routine entomological surveillance should occur across those areas. And I will really focus on um, the routine vector surveillance in this talk. And the purpose of that um, as I've, I've sort of reiterating what I've already said is to be prepared, um, it's to determine the vector occurrence. And these activities should occur before an outbreak happens. So it, it's part of your preparedness and response. Um, and to define the insecticide resistance profile of the vector. So the, the, the idea is to get this information in advance and have it available um, when you're planning your activities. Information on the key larval habitats, um, there's the potential to track the density of mosquito populations and also to monitor the biting and resting behaviours of the vectors. And Amanda already showed this slide and um, we've got the low, moderate and high tier here. And um, what I really wanted to, to highlight is that there's, there are different priorities of um, the, the uh, vector surveillance activities. So we have in, an adult occurrence and resistance frequency have really been highlighted as the first line priority. So where um, capacity is limited, that's where um, programs should start to try and focus their activities on understanding which mosquitoes vectors are present in the area and what their resistance profile is. Um, and there's some indications here of how frequently this could occur. And, and this would be obviously up to um, the country partners to adapt this to, to be suitable for their country and their um, situations. And routine surveillance is to be conducted um, at sentinel sites. And it's really recommended that um, each country outline sentinel sites being locations where the activities can be repeated over time. And the idea is to use the same site so that you can start building up profiles over time. If you, but then if you detect issues, you could perhaps move out from there and and look at um, additional areas. And, and central sites um, should be selected so that there is an, not too many that it's, it's, not, it's not possible within your capacity, but enough that it tries to cover some um, different, different mosquito species or environmental conditions and, and represents your, your country and situation. And this is probably a bit too much detail, but, but there, this information is available in the frameworks and the documents and 
um, this, I guess, is, is just an idea of where we're trying to get to, um, not, not in this workshop, but the entire process of supporting to, um, everybody with the updates of the strategic plans is to start thinking about how you can work through what your priority vector surveillance indicators would be, how frequently um, you would, would be capable of monitoring those, where the, um, and the, how much mosquito surveillance you could do and trying to outline line that and, and um, building up a set of goals and um, a work plan that is achievable and pr would provide meaningful information. So I'll move on to, to vector control, um, changing track here. So with vector control activities being interventions that limit the ability of the mosquito population to transmit pathogens. Um, traditionally, this is done by um, reducing mosquito biting rates, um, preventing them from biting humans or killing the mosquitoes. Um, and, and the novel tools such as Wolbachia um, can reduce the vector competence of the mosquito population. Um, so I just wanna um, make a few notes on the differences between proactive and reactive vector control. This is something that's gonna come up a lot um, with these words proactive and reactive really being focused on the timing of vector control. And as Amanda um, indicated that there's really a strong push to move towards activities that are proactive. And that being um, proactive vector control occurring before an outbreak occurs. And, and there's sustained ongoing activities that help to reduce the frequency and scale of outbreaks. And this is contrasted with reactive vector control. Reactive vector control is performed after there is an increase in the um, disease. So this is, if you have the epidemiological curve, this is the number of infected people. This starts going up, the number, the density of mosquitoes is also going up and that reactive vector control is coming in when there is an outbreak. Um, it's often initiated late in the process. You're often feeling like you're chasing your tail um, and it, it can be very difficult to get on top of the situation. Um, so yeah, the current guidance um, to reiterate really um, has a focus moving towards um, sustained proactive vector control that occurs the, um, across moderate to high areas of um, the, where the risk of an outbreak is moderate to high and before an outbreak occurs. And then once you have an outbreak, if, um, at least one case, depending on the transmission scenario, that um, you can move towards this re reactive vector control. Okay, so then the next question is, what can we do? Um, your and yeah, it's it's. There are limited vector control tools available um, at the moment, and there's there's a number that are in development, um, and the insecticide-based ones have issues with insecticide resistance. But we have what we have, and the vector control when it is implemented um, routinely, proactively. Um, and strategically is effective and has been demonstrated to um, control um, arboviruses. And there, there's no question it's, it's our best tool that is available. So I'm, I'm just gonna go through um, a few of the key ones that are available and just point out a few things. I think some you'll already know. Um, larval source management, so that's the removal destruction covering or emptying aquatic habitats and um, with a strong community component. Larviciding being the regular application of microbial or chemical insecticides to the water bodies. Um, I just wanted to make a note here about um, residual insecticide spraying, so indoor residual spraying, um, which is using yeah, insecticides with a, that are long lasting and are applied to the 
indoor surfaces inside houses. Um, this is really traditionally thought as a tool for the control of anopheles mosquitoes. However, recently it has been demonstrated that this is actually a very effective tool also for controlling Aedes, especially Aedes aegypti that do rest inside houses. Um, there are differences between um, targeting the Anopheles and the Aedes as in so much that um, you need to think about the places where your target mosquito prefer to rest. So for Aedes, especially Aedes aegypti, it's um, internal walls lower than one and a half meters behind furniture, behind cupboards, under tables um, and small dark areas. And that's where the insecticide is targeted to and is very, very effective. Um, and it can last for up to six months or more depending on the insecticide used. Another tool is outdoor residual spraying or harborage spraying. Um, this is also a long lasting insecticide that's carefully applied to um, heavily vegetated areas, usually um, peri-domestic. So um, those places where other pictures in particular like to rest that are near to houses. You can um, do like a barrier spray around on the vegetation and it can last for quite a while. Um, and this has been effective and, and used well in areas. So, this is different to fogging. Um, so we have um, firstly a note here um, that fogging or a space spraying can be done indoors. Um, and it does not have a residual effect and needs to be applied uh, frequently. And um, there, there are some changes in the, the recommendations in terms of um, space spraying and fogging in so much that there really is a move now towards um, applying the insecticides in this that are the, the residual insecticides and moving away from this. Um, fogging with um, indoor applications of fogging being um, only supported for really extreme emergencies and, and they have to be, it has to be repeated weekly at least um, to have any impact. Uh, and then our traditional outdoor space spraying. Um, and it really, um, we've seen now that it has, it, it's very short lasting. So it doesn't have that residual impact on the um, mosquitoes and it can actually have quite strong environmental impacts as well. So. Um, the current guidance is really, we would really like to discuss trying to shift away from this outdoor space spraying towards um, a carefully applied residual insecticides. And through this process, you'll see that um, you'll use less insecticide, it'll be much more effective and there'll be less environmental impacts, but there, you will need to do a lot of education with your communities um, and stakeholders about this change in um, insecticide practice as well in terms of how it's more beneficial, but it's definitely not going to have that big visual community um, protection feel that comes with the, the fogging that everyone's been so used to for years. Um, so these are my last couple of slides here and then I'll, I'll hand back to Maxine and Maru. Um, there is a fair bit of detail on these slides, but as I reiterate, as I said, it was it's all in the um, the frameworks and the eighties manual, so we've got those references there. But just to talk, just to to summarise that um, with the vector control, it, it, you know we have a similar framework for vector surveillance, um, understanding that you could have um, areas that don't actually yet have any other virus cases, um, but could be at high risk of an outbreak. So in you know, areas where it, with frequently incoming travelers and, and there is um, the recommendation is really to move towards sustained proactive to control in these areas. Um, and what could that be? Um, and that that is really the first line would be focused on um, larval control being source reduction and community engagement to try and get ahead of 
um, that outbreak to keep those mosquito um, populations low. So the, the residual spraying, the indoor residual spraying or outdoor residual spraying is there and that could be a second line tool um, that could occur prior to the peak transmission season. And, and these are um, simply just guidance as well. So it really depends on what works. These, these are just an indication. Um, the, the types of tools, the packages, the timing, um, the locations, it all really depends on what works for you and, and your country as well. And, and we just want to try and sort of step through this a little bit to help give you an idea of, of um, what could be possible and then, and then talk one-on-one -on -one and, and help to adapt it to your situations. Um, so in terms of um, once you have an, um, cases in the area, um, things start to get complicated um, where you have many different transmission scenarios, uh, isolated cases in the area or um, multiple, multiple locally acquired cases. And, and depending on those different transmission scenarios, it really depends that that influences a lot um, the vector control activities. Um, and once you've got cases in the area, we're, we're moving towards more reactive vector control to try and get on top of things. So um, in terms of, um, of what you could be doing, um, where you have isolated cases in the area or multiple locally acquired cases that exceed the outbreak threshold, so a full blown outbreak, the focus is really to move towards um, killing the adult population and quickly. So getting rid of those adult mosquitoes that are possibly able to transmit mosquitoes. And the best way to do that is going to be with those residual insecticides um, that could be applied immediately to um, high risk areas, to the cave house, to the contact houses, um, in indoors or outdoors. And that, that depends on what mosquito species is transmitting. So if you have Aedes aegypti, it would be indoors. Um, and then, so in areas where you don't have an outbreak, the vector control is more um, proactive. So looking um, with a, a strong focus on larval control. Um, and my last slide, just thanks, just to reiterate that there are a lot of partners involved and please, um, where we're all here, we can ask a lot of questions during the workshop, but also afterwards as well. So thanks. Thank you very much, Tanya. If anybody's oh, got any, that's if, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, we would have time at the end of today's session to take any further questions. So also, if you want to hear specifically from Amanda or Tanya, just um, pop, pop a note down to yourself and we'll come to some time at the end when we're wrapping up to take some other questions. So what I want to do now is just briefly um, share with you before this session, we asked you to talk about, uh, we sent out a bit of a survey and a few of you have had a chance to fill it out, just what helps you or what are a barrier to completing strategic plans. And so I'll just go through the results of that now. And then we're going to break into a small group work uh, to try to try to share some ideas about barriers and facilitators and how to either use them or uh, overcome barriers from each other, uh, learn from each other. So people identified as strength factors, um, getting support from experts, getting support from government, or also having highly localized dengue cases and um, that making it a lot easier to actually respond in a very um, circumscribed location. Facilitators for implementation included integration into existing programs. And we've said quite a few times today that 
uh, you know, we need to understand where your um, vector control plans are and are they integrated, linked to others, or how do you want them linked as we try to support you in this process of finalising plans. Political support and expert support, again, is useful and also increased resources. Challenges to implementing your plans. There were internal challenges, a lack of human resources, a lack of any resources more broadly, and a lack of priority, particularly from internal leadership and from the government. And external challenges are things sometimes outside your control like trash disposal, other socioeconomic barriers, unplanned urbanization, and uncontrolled sale and use of insecticides. So we thought we'd use that as a stimulus for you to now break into some group work to try to talk about your own barriers and facilitators, but particularly how you overcame those, because how you overcome them is going to be part of your strategic plan. But I just wanted to briefly remind you of the logic of planning. And these slides will be made available to you. So I'll go through this very quickly. Next slide, please, Maru. So basically, you've seen all of the different things that you need to <clears throat> excuse me, think about the components that will need to be there in your vector control strategic plan. These were things that you were talked about in your survey, and we'll go into a bit more of these in details. But one of the things I want to point out is that all of these things are interdependent. Um, you know, when you start planning your vector control, you're going to be thinking about, well, what's the community engagement strategy we need? So that will help you then build up that community engagement part of your plan. Who are the people we need to do the vector control? Can we train them in time? Have we got that capacity? So that starts helping you think about your human resource and your human training plan. And part of taking a stepping back and looking at the overall logic of your plan is to make sure that you have the whole picture in view, because often we do all of these little components in a lot of detail, but we have to step back to make sure is that actually going to help us control vectors and their diseases they bring um, if we do it all together. So on the next slide, um, and these are definitions that come out of uh, the framework. So this already is in the framework for more detail. But your strategic plan will have a vision or if you like, the greater why, the long term impact, what's the long term impact. And in the little blue box on the left hand side, these are two examples that are in the framework about what might your vision might be. You may already have that worked out. Then you have the goals. Why? What are we hoping to achieve? What's the immediate impact of the program over the next five years. <clears throat> and again, there's some examples there that have come out of uh, the framework about examples of goals. Then the objectives, for what? For what are we doing this? This is your strategies or your implementation steps. And your, these objectives need to be specific, measurable and have completion dates. And if you look on the right hand side, you'll see some examples of those that come out of the framework. And you'll see there, uh, for example, the first one, at least 50% and at least five of the nine districts by December 2022. So it's got that specific measurable and completion date. And then when you have those, then you start thinking about the outputs, the activities and the inputs. But then you've got to go all the way back up and work out if we do all of, if we have all of those inputs to do those activities, is that actually going to give us those outputs and objectives and help us reach the goal? So you have to go back and review your plan with those questions in mind. On the next slide, again, just as we've said, those SMART objectives, I'm sure you've probably all heard of that specific, measurable, applicable, realistic, and timely. And that's, again, part of that logic check you need to take, particularly the realistic. As Tanya and Amanda have said throughout this morning or this afternoon for some of you, um, we're giving you frameworks about what might be um, the evidence base, but you have to contextualise it to your setting. And that's going to be an important part as we work together 
over the next few months to help you with your plans. Next slide is those outputs. They are the services or products that need to be delivered, what your program is hoping to deliver. And they're often a bit more detailed than the objectives, but again, should be able to be measured. And on the next slide, the activities. And this is often what many of us think about straight away. When we think about a vector control, we think straight away about, well, we've got to spray, we've got to collect data, we've got to go and set some traps. We often think about those activities, train some people, but those activities need to be linked to specific outputs. You need to allocate people or groups to do those. You need to make sure that people have the skills and the expertise to do that. And again, we'll need those linked a little bit in a chronological order so that you understand what needs to be done to then do something else, to then do something else. And so we'll be working through those activities to make sure that they're actually in the right time to be able to achieve the outputs and the objectives you've talked about. The last slide, I think, oh no, the next slide, again, you'll have a look at these, just something about indicators of performance. But later in this workshop, Mara is going to spend some time talking to you about monitoring and evaluation. And she'll talk a little bit more around these types of indicators and where you get that data from. The next slide will quickly just make you realize it's a little bit about what we were just discussing in those breakouts. What might be some of those external factors that you need to assume are going to be done? Uh, you know, you need to assume that you're going to still get government support. You need to assume that there may not be um, another pandemic come along once this one finishes. So there are some assumptions, but there's also risks. There may be things you want to do, but there are risks attached to doing those. And you need to talk about those when you start doing your plan. They affect sustainability, but they're very context specific. In the next slide, and this is the last slide. This is then when you think you've got it all, and I know many of you have got a draft strategic plan. Um, some of you haven't, but this is a checking the logic and basically you go from left to right. If we do all of those activities and those risks and assumptions are addressed, they don't cause problems, then will we achieve those objectives? And if we do those objectives, and our assumptions hold true, will we be able to reach the vision? And so that is the checking you have to do when you have to get above the, the detail of the plan to check the logic that it is actually going to help you achieve the vision and the goal that you have for your plan. 